I have been promising a RAM overclocking guide for seemingly forever. So I've got the Kingston HyperX Blue 4 gig kit of DDR3 memory on my test bench today. Uh, in addition to that, I do have a HyperX RAM fan, which I did an unboxing of a while back. I found it to be extremely high quality. I really like the look of it overall. And the other relevant things that I have today on my test bench are a Core i7 uh, 875K unlock CPU, so that's what's going on under the hood over here. And then I'm using a P7P55DE premium motherboard, in case you are wondering. So, the first thing we're going to do today is we're going to get everything set up for a baseline reading. So that means I've got my CPU set up at stock frequency, and I've actually turned off turbo mode. So we are just going to be running it at pure stock frequency. This is going to allow us to see exactly what impact just changing the memory has on an otherwise completely stable baseline system. Okay, the other thing that I've done is I've enabled the XMP profile for this memory. So that goes ahead and changes all the memory timings for me. Isn't that handy? Uh, make sure you buy memory with XMP if you don't want to fuss around with all of this stuff. So it goes ahead, changes the frequency to 1600 megahertz, changes the timings to 99927. These are your primary timings. The most important one is this one right here. That is the CAS, CAS latency. So here, this frequency, that is the speed of the memory. So that's how, how fast it cycles around. These ones are the delay. So higher this and lower this is always better. 1N or 1T or 2N or 2T, that's a secondary timing. That does have an impact on performance as well. And then these voltages that it's dialed in, for me 1.65, that's the memory voltage, and 1.3, that is the voltage of the integrated memory controller on the CPU. You should be aware that with Core i7 and Core i5 CPUs, you should never go over 1.65 volts on the memory because you can damage the memory controller that is built into the CPU. So we're gonna go ahead, take some baseline readings, and then we're gonna come back and play around with some of these settings a little bit and see how much more performance we can squeeze out of this memory. Now that we've got the RAM dialed into our uh, stock XMP overclocked profile, you can see here all of these settings are correct and the CPU is running at its stock frequency. We're just going to take a couple of benchmarks as a baseline here. So SuperPi is a popular memory benchmark because what it does is it gives you uh, probably the largest possible separation between uh, like minute setting. Basically, it's, it's a very, very fine way of measuring the, the performance of the CPU and RAM. And it'll give you differences that you otherwise wouldn't be able to measure. So you can figure out if what you're doing is beneficial or not. So you can see we calculated pi to 1 million decimal places, and we end up with a result of zooming in so I can see. Oh, no, that's not right. Calculate one million decimal places. It's giving me the wrong one here. So now I'll click to start. Okay. And let's find out what we get this time. And we're going to take a quick 3D mark reading as well. And then we're going to come back to these benchmarks once we've played around with the frequency, latencies of the memory, and we're going to see how much we are able to improve our system performance. So there, there's the real value is 14.305 seconds. All right, so we're going to run 3D Mark, and then I'll be back in a minute once that's done. So there you have it. Our baseline 3D Mark 06 reading is 18,534. So 18,534 3D Marks. It should also be noted, I am running these benchmarks with turbo mode disabled on the CPU. So it is running only at the default CPU multiplier of 22x, it is not scaling up when I run intensive benchmarks. This is just to isolate the RAM as the performance variable that we're looking at today. So the first thing we're going to try today is leaving our timings at default, leaving all the voltages the same because we don't really want it. That's outside the scope of this particular video. We don't want to tinker around with those. And what we're going to go ahead and do is take the CPU ratio and turn it down. So we're still very close to the 2.926 target CPU frequency. And then we're going to turn up the base clock. Now turning up the base clock is going to give us a bit of a boost at equal frequency on the CPU. And then it's also going to give us at the same DDR3 speed. So go, I'm going to go ahead. So 146 is where I'm headed. So 133 is stock. You can see at 133, the options I have are all of your standard DDR3 speed options. But as soon as I go up to 146, that 1600 megahertz option turns into 17. 
50. So we're going to go ahead and see if we can boot up at these speeds and if we're stable and what kind of performance impact that's going to make. Okay, I've done some tinkering around and staying within the same CPU frequency range, so about 2.93 gigahertz, I have found that the highest I was able to go was by lowering the CPU ratio to 17x and increasing the base clock to 172. So this gives us a DDR3 speed of 2.064 gigahertz. The RAM was stable at this speed, so we're going to take some more benchmarks and we're going to find out what we gained by increasing the memory speed to 2 gigahertz. Now one thing that I do want to point out is that you do not have to run the CPU at stock speed. In fact, there's probably more benefit to overclocking the RAM when you're running an overclocked CPU because the CPU needs more data to keep it fed. But the reason that I did it this way is because what you'd normally do is find your max CPU frequency. In this case, I'm pretending my max CPU frequency is stock speed. So you'd find your max CPU frequency and then you'd tune the RAM from there. So uh, once you, by the time you're tuning RAM, you're already trying to stay within kind of a, a fixed range of CPU frequencies. So we'll go ahead, fire up CPU Z, fire up Super Pi. So you can see we're running our CPU at stock speed. Our RAM is now running substantially faster. This is one half of the actual data rate because it is a DDR class of memory. So we're running, start to calculate, to one million decimal places. So here we are, we've seen a 25% increase in RAM speed. And let's see how much of a speed increase we will gain from that. So 14.227 is our new Super Pi 14.227 is our new Super Pi score and then we'll go ahead and have a look at the 3D Mark score in a moment. So we end up with a score of 18,692 which is a slight boost over what we were recording as our baseline although it's pretty much within the margin of error. Uh, so the overclocking method that we used today was just increasing the RAM frequency. Uh, we found it didn't have much of an impact, but look at it this way. You buy the HyperX Blue, and obviously your results may vary. You can get upwards of a 25% increase in speed over what it's actually rated for, which even if it only gives you like a 1% increase in uh, a couple of the programs you use, it is a free increase nonetheless. So we're going to see how low we can go with latency overclocking and see if we can get some bigger boosts that way. Stay tuned for more. By simply adjusting the latencies, we were able to go from 999 27 latencies all the way down to 77720 and when you consider the cost difference between kits that are otherwise basically identical so you look at uh, kits like this where it's a 4 gig kit uh, 2 by 2 gigabyte DDR3 1600 and CL9 versus CL8 and you see upwards of a $20 price delta well it starts to make uh, like an overclocking friendly kit like the blue that we're using today look like a pretty good value if you can get all of that extra headroom out of it. So let's have a look at our SuperPi calculation for our uh, C7 overclocking. In this case, uh, latency reduction more than like increasing the clock speed overclocking. So it's a little bit different. Okay, so we see a score of 14 point. No, I missed it. Okay, we'll try again. I apologize for that. I guess I could, in theory, have just turned off the camera and gone back and read it, but um, I didn't think of that until now, and the camera's been running, so we might as well roll with it. Okay, so 14.29, that seems a little bit higher. 290. Okay, so I'll run my 3D Mark benchmark, and then I will be back in a moment. Okay, well at 18,654 3D marks, we don't see a huge performance difference between our stock 99927 timings and our tightened up 77720 timings. Uh, but this has been my DDR3 overclocking guide. I mean, if especially if you're done overclocking your CPU, because that's where you'll see some big performance gains, and you want to tinker with it a little bit more, I highly encourage you to go ahead, try overclocking your memory. Uh, don't forget to do stability checks, though, all along the way when you're doing any overclocking. And bear in mind, of course, that my results today are not necessarily reproducible if you buy the same RAM. 
I was lucky enough to get a 25% overclock in terms of frequency or a significant uh, two speed grade uh, bump down in latency, so an improvement in latency, uh, but you may not have the same results. So the best way, well not the best way, but the way that I use to, uh, to check if memory is stable is I use Prime95 Blend, I use a custom one, and then I go ahead and let it use all or most of the memory I have installed in the system. So as long as this doesn't crash over a period of 8 to 12 hours, you can assume that your RAM is pretty much stable and then that way even if it's only a small improvement you can have some performance improvement so thank you for checking out my guide don't forget to subscribe to linus tech tips as well as ncix.com for all of my videos